now we will spend our morning with Mary Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So it's been a long time since I've gotten the chance to be social. The farms across the river and I appreciate you all inviting me here today. It gets rather lonely out there and we've had rather a difficult time of it lately. There was recently a murder on my property. There was an enslaved man named Harry that murdered a man named Tame. Tame had been with me since my father willed him to me at three years old. Now the court did recompense me the 38 pounds they owed me for Harry, but it was quite a loss for Tame, considering I had known him my whole life. And then we had another incident with Miss Mary McDaniel, where my George was bathing in the river, and if you've ever been to my house, you know that the Old King's Highway runs not far from it. And also there's ferry right there at the end of the hill. So we have multiple people coming through our property every day. It's quite busy out there. Well, George was bathing in the river further down and Miss Mary McDaniel decided she was going to steal his clothes. Now, I'm sure she thought this a practical joke, but I did not find it funny when my child had to walk up to the house stock naked in front of people. And so I had this girl sued. She was convicted and she was given 15 lashes in the marketplace here in Fredericksburg. And I don't regret it. She shouldn't be doing things like that to my family. It has been difficult since Augustine died in 1743. It's now 1752, he's been gone for some time, but I still think about him. Uh, he came down with a complaint of a stomach ache, wrote his will and died the next day. And he left me a 35 year old widow, five children under the age of 12 to care for, 21, enslaved people on my property, another seven people that I have to provide for on another property, and I've been financially struggling. Now, people have tried to make introductions to me to remarry, and I don't wish to do so. And the reason for that is because will I to do so, Augustine has put a clause in his will that if his, that if his sons, my stepsons, don't like the way that the new husband is managing things, they can sue for custody of my children. And I will not have that. So, because of this clause, I have decided never to remarry and I will remain a widow for the rest of my life, I can promise you that. I still wear the ring that Augustine gave me when we were married, but he decided he wanted to be buried next to his first wife, Jane, at Pope's Creek, their house. Which is fine, I know that she was his first love, so my focus right now and for the rest of my life will always be on my children. I'm rather uh, what people have said to me, strong-willed, but I think my eldest George quite takes after me. I have not had an easy life from the start. I was born in 1708 in Lancaster, Virginia. I was the only child of Joseph and Mary Ball, but they had both been previously widowed and I did have half-brothers and half-sisters. My father died when I was only three years old. He left me 400 acres situated on the Rappahannock River, three enslaved people, including my tame I spoke about earlier, and enough feathers to fill a feather bed, which sounds silly, but they're, not, they're fairly rare. So I was taken care of, but my father died when I was three. My mother did remarry a man named Richard Hughes, and we moved to Northumberland County, so that is more or less where I grew up. When we moved there, my stepfather died when I was only six years old. My mother never remarried. When I was at the age of 13, my mother fell ill and she died and my brother followed her later that year. So I lost my mother, my brother, my stepfather and it's just not been easy. You feel very alone when you lose people and you have your own children to take care of and not much support. My woman, Lucy, she is rather close to me and I confide in her sometimes, but being across the river and having so many people come to the property to entertain, you would have think that I thought that I'd found more friends at this point. But I focus again on my children. My eldest, George, he's nearly 20 now and well, I've got great hopes for him. He had wanted to join the British Navy and his half-brother Lawrence had tried to convince him to do so. And I thought about it. It would have been, 
Well, it would have been, I, I, I thought, would have been a good career. However, I wrote to my brother Joseph Ball in England, and he advised me against it. He said that if George were to join the Navy, and George was only 14 at the time, that he would be treated like less than a dog. And most men do not die in combat on those ships. Most men die from disease. And so I would not let him go. Now, people often think that he would have had a better career had he joined the British Navy, but I don't think so. His half-brother Lawrence was able to make introductions to the Fairfax family when he married Anne, and George was given a job by Lord Fairfax. Now, you, as you well know, the Fairfaxes are very large landholders. And so George was taken to survey, and that is where he got most of his education. And now, at, or at the age of 19, he became the head surveyor of Culpeper County and remains so now, and I think that's going to make a very good career for him as the colonies continue to expand. I educated George myself. Now, I know you find that hard to believe. Oh, green tea, my favorite. I don't know who bought this for me, but if you got it from Mr. Broom, I know he's charging 18 shillings per pound of green tea, so thank you. I appreciate that. But I did educate my children. Um, there's a Reverend James Mary that moved uh, into town here across the river where we are now when George was about 13. I thought about sending him there, but we really couldn't afford it. And by 16, George had gotten his job with the Fairfax family. So I educated my children myself. I was educated as a child. I was tutored. And so I felt that that was enough. And my, child have gone, my children have gone on uh, to become their own people and to really take up the education that I gave them. And I helped think it helped form their personalities. So my daughter, Betty, got married at the age of 17. She married her cousin, Phelan Lewis. He's got a 1,300-acre tobacco plantation. He's got a store just a few blocks away from where we sit now. And he also has five ships that are trading with Liverpool. So she's well taken care of. And as her dowry, she brought in 400 pounds and two female slaves. Now, my other children, John and Augustine Jr., they're teenagers, so they do run around sometimes, and sometimes they'll get home a little late, but they live to, love to fish and hunt, and they're very close. My youngest, Charles, of course, is, well, you're not supposed to have favorites, but Charles might be my favorite. <laughs> Charles is my baby. Unfortunately, my last child, Mildred, passed away when she was only 16 months old. <laughs> and she died in my arms. And she only struggled for about two weeks, but I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> and having not known that Augusta was going to die, I decided then and there I was not having any more children. I was going to take care of the five that I had. And Charles was only five years old. The other children dealt with it. Well, <laughs> what do you do when your father dies? George is only 11. He needed a father figure, and I had to become both because I wasn't to remarry. The poor child was only five years old, and so we did a lot together. He became my, not my confidant, but certainly the child that was most helpful to me during, during my grief, but to see his grief as a little boy. <laughs> It hurts a mother not just to lose her husband, but to watch her children suffer as well. I'm sorry. You've had me here and I've had a lot of my heart. And I deeply appreciate that you were here and understand my struggles, my financial struggles. I'm still trying to keep up a sense of propriety And I hope I've done that. I do hope you all will come to visit me if you get a chance to come across the river. The ferry stops right in my yard, so there's no reason for you not to come. And I would like to have you over for tea as well. So if you would, please kindly forgive me for my emotion today. I don't usually get like this in front of people. And, but I do appreciate the fact that you allowed me to be social today and come here and speak with you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank <laughs> you.
Yes, there ma'am. was an author, I think it was Douglas Southall Freeman, mm -hmm. who wrote about Mary Washington. Mm -hmm. And he was not very complimentary. What do you think of his writing? Uh, and that extends well into Ron Chernow's biography, too. You know, um, it's Mary within her own time was very much revered. In fact, George said within his lifetime um, that there should be a monument erected to my mother, which, as you know, there were three attempts to put that monument up and it's finally, you know, was there. Um, and so, you know, he wore a black badge of mourning for five months. His cabinet members did. He, cre he basically declared a national mourning. Um, I think George and Mary probably had a very, very close personality if you look at the actions he made during his life and the sacrifices and the sacrifices she made. Uh, but right around the turn of the century, uh, and, I, and I don't know if this is a direct result of, of the, uh, you know, the suffrage movement um, or the women's movement, um, but a lot of these male authors start to portray her uh, in this sort of just negative sense. And um, it's, I think it was an effort to make it look like George did everything on his own, that he's this self-made man. And he certainly was very motivated. I mean, considering the origins he came from, uh, what he was able to do in his lifetime, I mean, he started country, so, you know, there's that. Uh, but I think he got a lot of his, his personality from his mother. And uh, lots of times, you know, what ends up happening is just over the centuries, um, these authors start sort of regurgitating each other uh, without looking at original sources and documents. And so uh, then they just quote each other. You know, you read a book that was written 100 years ago, you think, oh, well, this person was closer to that time period and they did their research, and so I'm just going to quote them. Um, there's a quote in Ron Chernow's book where he talks about uh, one of her nephews saying at one point, um, of the mother I was 10 times more afraid of than my own, and then he cuts the quote. Well, the rest of that quote is, but she awed me with her kindness for she was truly kind. And so that sort of thing happens. Um, you know, and then the other thing is attributes that uh, are considered positive for men, um, outspokenness, you know, strong, being strong-willed um, for a long time and, and sometimes still are, are often viewed as, uh, you know, negative, uh, at, at, you know, attributes towards women. So obviously that's changed a lot over the years, but certainly within that time period, uh, that would not have been the case. So did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, hello. Um, the education of George and Sibling, mm -hmm. especially by Reverend Marie. Can you tell us more about that? So there's no really definitive proof that he was ever tutored by the Reverend Mary. Um, as I mentioned, you know, he does not open that school on this side of the river until George is 13 years old. And we know by 16 and possibly 15, he was off serving for the Fairfax family. So if he was educated by the Reverend James Mary, it was within that three year period. Um, what we have is a basically a comment from uh, George Washington Park Custis, who is a entertaining man, uh, but you know, he, he sometimes st stretches the truth a little bit, but it's a personal account where basically it was a family story that uh, George was often seen chasing around after a big red-headed girl, is what he says. So uh, that's the reference to him attending that school. It is quite possible that he did. Uh, it's just there is really no written documentation of it, unless you've seen some. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you find some, please let me know. <laughs> Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Martha and Mary? So um, we don't know a whole lot about that. And uh, that, again, is, is uh, often portrayed in a rather negative sense because at one point when Mary is getting older and, you know, she, get, she gets the flu in, in uh, winter of 1771, almost dies. And so at that point, she makes the decision she wants to move into town to be closer to her doctors. But Charles and Betty are living in town. She doesn't want to live with them. Uh, at one point, there's a letter that I think goes to um, – John Augustine, or I'm sorry, not John Augustine. Um, yes, no, John Augustine, where they talk about her moving in with him uh, and then possibly Betty. Um, but George writes this letter basically dissuading um, Mary from living at Mount Vernon because of the constant flow of people that were coming through. And in her older age, she would have had to get up super early, get dressed up, be ready to entertain. And he just thought that that would not make her comfortable, that he wanted her to be able to rest. And so he writes that uh, he, he bought her house situated close to my sister, Lewis. Um, and so George, you know, Mary would have, the, the path that goes to the Mary Washington Garden, which you, was it 22 years? 
22 years, he took care of that garden, uh, you know, from an aerial view, connects with the other path of, of they didn't call it Kenmore, it became named that by the Gordon family, but um, that's the path she would have taken, you know, to visit Betty and visit her grandchildren. Charles was still in town, you know, he had children, and so uh, she's spending a lot of time in other places. You know, her original house, and I'm sure most of you being from Fredericksburg know this, but just that small left-hand portion was there. It was just a two-room cottage with an upstairs loft. So I kind of compare it almost to like a mother-in-law suite. Uh, which she would have slept there and spent time there, but most of the time she's visiting, you know, um, her, her children. So does that answer your question? I kind of got off track there. What was the original? Uh, what was the original? The relationship between Mary and, and Martha. Um, so I think it's because of that letter of George dissuading her. It's like, well, did these two women get along? Is that why he's saying that? Um, I don't think so. You know, there's a if you read uh, Fre George's Fredericksburg Dyer in entries, which uh, are condensed in one of Paul Felder's books, George Washington's Fredericksburg. Um, there is a point where he um, and Martha and um, Jackie and Nellie come with him to visit her. Um, other than that, there's really not much information. I mean, so uh, obviously Martha had, was down here uh, and had some kind of interaction relationship, but there's really nothing to say that they had a bad relationship. And I mean, as you know, when George married Martha, she was the wealthiest widow in Virginia. Um, and George married up. I mean, he was 27, she was 29, I think. And so she brought in all that Custis money, thousands of acres of land, you know, and I'm, I'm fairly certain I could say Mary probably was not against the match because of the finances. So I've, I've heard all kinds of ranges of, of numbers, but I've heard 3 million, I've heard 8 million, somewhere within that very large gap. <laughs> thank you. Sure, thank you. I know you have a soft spot for Charles who stands on him and his life. Well, he's, <laughs> um, he's my baby. He was the child I was closest to, the child that clung to me for a long time. And I think, you know, not always, but a lot of times when, uh, if you have an only child or you have, you know, your youngest, um, that's your last one. And so you realize, oh, that sense of, you know, um, that sense of feeling of, of knowing you're not gonna have any more, uh, knowing this is your final one kind of plays into that. Um, I've been very proud of Charles, you know, he, um, Charles was important, I think, um, very more so to Fredericksburg. You know, he's one of the lesser known Washington brothers, but while he was here in Fredericksburg, I mean, he, uh, along with Fielding Lewis, you know, they were put in charge of the Committee for Safety, you know, to raise the militia in case, you know, uh, the British never made it this far in, which they didn't. Um, he was a vestryman at St. George's Church. Uh, at one point, he and Fielding raised supplies to send to the people of Boston Harbor after the British cut the port after the Boston Tea Party. Um, and so he was very much involved here in Fredericksburg. Um, there is a letter, and this is where sometimes Charles gets some negativity, where George writes him saying he needs to pay off his debts and, and stop, you know, going to taverns. Um, so uh, the, the thing that gets said about Charles is that, oh, he was a drunk. Well, there's nothing to say that. And they, they drank uh, like three times the amount that, that the average American does today back then. If you don't have TV and iPads, I mean, you gotta entertain yourself somehow. But you know, these taverns were lots of times where a lot of these um, conversations happen. You know, where R&R &R Antiques is on Caroline Street, that spot is where Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute of Freedom, or I'm sorry, the Virginia Statute of um, Religious Freedom. Um, so, a lot of these conversations, the Apollo Room at uh, the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg is where our founding fathers were meeting on a pretty regular basis. They had these committees of correspondence, committees of safety. So, um, you know, Charles would have been very much involved in that in this area. And I think he's very much important to Fredericksburg. And when I'm at the Rising Sun Tavern, I make sure to stress that, uh, you know, he's most famous for signing the Leeds Town Resolves, uh, which was the first public outcry against the Stamp Act, which was later repealed a year later. Uh, but it's not, not the first, but one of the first documents to use the phrase no tax taxation without representation, which is kind of what we based our, our you know, not based the whole war on, because uh, obviously, you know, no king within, you know, almost 150 years had ever visited here. How, how are you supposed to follow, you know, a king when you, you've never met them? You know, your family's been here for three or four generations at that point, you know, so, yes. Isn't uh, Charlestown now known as Charleston named after Charles? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so in 1781, 
uh, Charles leaves Fredericksburg and uh, goes, it is, some of the land was given to him by his half-brother Lawrence and he gave, Lawrence gave some land to some other people, but of course it was Virginia at the time, not West Virginia. Um, but his home happy retreat out there uh, just opened as a museum in 2018. And uh, Walter Washington, who is Samuel Washington's fifth great grandson is the one that, that runs it. Um, all that was there when Charles was there was that far right-hand side. Um, so he dies in 1799, um, but he had spent the rest of his life out there, and he is credited with basically starting that town. If you go up there, um, most of the street names are named after Charles's children or relatives. Um, there's probably more Washington descendants. You know, we have Betty's descendants in this area. Uh, more Washington descendants in that area because both Samuel and Charles lived there. Um, and Charles, Samuel had six wives, uh, not at the same time, but uh, you know, <laughs> over the, he had a lot of children. So, um, so yes. How many children did Charles have? Four. Yes, ma'am. Who did Charles marry? Someone from Fredericksburg? He married his cousin, Mildred Thornton, uh, who was the daughter of Francis and Francis Thornton. So husband and wife had it, the same name spelled two different ways, so I bet that was kind of confusing. But there's a lot of Mildreds in the family, too. So just like with the boys, they named the girls the same thing over and over in the family tree. It's very confusing. So. Did you go to church regularly with the children, and what was your connection? I'm assuming you're St. George's church. Yes, ma'am. I attended St. George's. Um, we uh, would cross the river and, uh, you know, St. George's Church was the, the oldest church in town. We, we know that. Uh, of course, none of it's the original building, but Mary would have attended services there uh, as well as the other Washington family members. When George has accounts of him attending services there. And actually, there's a, a funny letter that uh, I can't quote completely, but he talks about, it, it was a diary entry, uh, some big commotion happened in the church, like there was some noise or something of something falling, and all the, the, the congregation overreacted and ran out of the church, and there was this great commotion. So we know here, he, along with his brothers and sisters, also attended church at St. George's. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate your effort. Thank you.